I should think most of you will be a little bit surprised and a bit intrigued by the title of this, this talk tonight. Um, and I should say that I myself am a little bit surprised about it. This really originated out of um, um, a conference which I attended at the Institute of Archaeologists, Field Archaeologists, um, in 2007, where I was asked to, um, to, talk some, to talk to them about um, Islamic archaeology and, um, and, and how it affected um, and its relationship to archaeology in Britain. Um, and I thought, rather than simply talking about Islamic archaeology, the archaeology of Islamic society within the Muslim world, it'd be interesting to see if it was possible to talk about archaeology, actually, within Britain, arch material remains within Britain. Um, and at this point, I suppose it's worth, worth sort of thinking a little bit, because not, there are some archaeologists here, but um, I should think most people aren't, to saying a little bit about what archaeology is. Archaeology, certainly in my understanding, is, um, is, uh, is a discipline which looks, looks at the past rather than through documents, through books, through written accounts, but looking at it through objects. And objects can be anything from you know, small, uh, glass or something like that uh, to a building. So I look at the whole category of material objects from the past, and that's what I consider to be archaeology. Um, so that's sort of briefly the background. Now, um, why, why did I decide to talk about this? I suppose because I think the relationship between Britain and the Islamic world, and by extension Europe and the Islamic world, is something which is contentious and also quite complex. And I think all too often people try to um, simplify this and make it into something about opposites, about two different sides, two, two different world views, and as if there's, there isn't any contact, or as if it's a very simple matter. So, um, and you'll probably be aware of lots of different views about this relationship. Um, and one of the most prevalent views is, uh, is this, uh, this concept of Orientalism, and it's something which um, a famous Palestinian-Egyptian scholar, uh, Edward Said, uh, wrote about in the 1970s. And he, he, he wrote that really the whole concept of Oriental studies, just the name of Oriental studies, and the whole concept of Oriental studies was a way of studying the Orient, in particular the Middle East and the Islamic Orient, um, as a way of having control over it, as a way of, of, of looking at it in a patronizing way. So that's, 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 that's one, one prominent view of the relationship between, say, Europe, America, and the Islamic world in the past. Uh, that's recently been criticised by a number of scholars, most notably uh, Robert Irwin, who's actually said that there's quite a lot of good things that have come out of Europeans studying the, uh, the, the Islamic world. So that's, that's, that's sort of one, one type of view. But also, there's all sorts of other, other ways in which we can think about the relationship between, between um, uh, Europe and Britain and the Islamic world. And <coughs> I suppose the most obvious one is trade. Um, today, there's huge volumes of trade between, between Britain and Europe and the Islamic world. And as I hope to show, that's something which, which we can trace right back into the past. There's also the question of warfare. That is something that's all too familiar to many of us. Um, and this, most people connect that with, I suppose, the Crusades and, and what's happening in, 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 in the present day. <clears throat> and then, I suppose, a, a very, very important com sort of means of contact is, of course, immigration. And that's predominantly uh, immigration of Muslims into Britain. And to a certain extent, um, uh, Europeans and British people going going to Muslim countries. And then, finally, I suppose, there's, there's a concept which embraces most of these, but is, is worth, worth thinking about, which is the whole concept of empire. The British Empire, I think at one stage it had um, 
the most the British Empire had the most Muslims in the world. Most Muslims in the world lived within the British Empire. So <coughs> in that in that sense, Britain has a very, very strong relationship to the Muslim world. It's something which is which which is very much part of of, of um, certainly recent identity. So that's just a, a little sort of background. Um, <coughs> okay, I think um Somebody asked me before this talk, and I think it's worth repeating, is when, when was Britain's first contact with the Islamic world? This is uh, worth thinking about. And um, there's uh, somebody called Scarth Beckett who's uh, recently done a book on um, Anglo-Saxon perceptions of the Islamic world. And she's, she's traced these in a lot of detail. But, um, but really, the, I suppose the first, first real um, evidence we've got is from uh, the chronicles of Villebold and Arculf, both from the 8th century, who, um, who, who travelled as pilgrims to, to Jerusalem. And obviously, on, during this pilgrimage, they met with and interacted with, um, with Muslims. OK, so that's, that's tracing things right backwards. Now, um, I'm just, hopefully this will work. Yeah, OK. Right, good. So, um, Just to just to help you think a little bit about about these relations, um, uh, this is a this is a pa this is a painting made in uh, 1740, and it's a painting of uh, William Levitt and Mamzelle Galvani. In other words, two Europeans, um, and not what you typically associate with uh, with this type of clothing and this type of setting. Now. Um, William Levitt was the uh, chief, rep chief representative of the Levant Company in Constantinople, in what is modern-day Turkey. And the Levant Company was a company which was established in, um, in 1581 uh, by Queen Elizabeth. And it was uh, a, a, a company that was uh, established with the, uh, to promote trade between, between, um, between England and the Levant. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. And it was a treaty between Elizabeth I and Murad. So that's one sort of idea of um, relations between Muslims and, uh, in that case, specifically English. Um, this, this, I've put this, this picture on to show you another, another way, another one of those ways which I talked about, uh, the way people see the relationship between, uh, in this case, Europe and uh, and and. The Islamic world, and this is a this is a from Santiago de Compostela in Spain, and it's a, a picture of Saint James, who is characterised certainly within this within this sculpture as the Moor Slayer. Um, and the legend behind this is that um, Saint James, that's Saint James from the Bible, appeared to Christian troops fighting uh, a Muslim army at the Battle of Clavijo in 844. Um, and so this, this obviously shows a very negative aspect of this relationship between, um, between Europeans and Islam. And you can see all these people being chopped up. It's not very nice. And interestingly, uh, fairly recently, I think there were moves to have this, uh, this statue either covered up or, or, or not shown because it seemed to be uh, provocative. OK, next one. Again, staying in Spain. Uh, again... We're moving into um, this is a, 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 a casket, the Burgos casket. It's n one of a number of caskets, similar similar boxes made of made of wood and inlaid with ivory panels. And these these sort of bo boxes and caskets were were highly treasured items, and they're made specifically for usually for royalty. Or, um, or very prominent members of the nobility within, within uh, dynasties in, in Muslim Spain. And, um, and we can tell that because the inscriptions along the top usually record the name of the person who is the intended recipient of these gifts. Um, these caskets have been studied in quite a lot of detail by somebody called uh, Avinoam Shalem. And he, in his analysis of 
both the iconography of the um, of, of the panels and also in the way that the the caskets were reused later, and examination of the historical context uh, said that, that they're probably to be to be regarded as um, trophies of war. In other words, these are very very personal objects held by the royalty, and the fact that they were taken by um, by by Christian warriors was uh, demonstrates that they were able, they're really defeating uh, the Muslims. And many of these subsequently found their way into uh, church treasuries and were uh, used as um, reliquaries. In other words, uh, boxes to store relics. Next one. Okay. And this is, a, this is a, another, another picture just to show this complex relationship between, um, and another way of thinking about the relationship between um, Europe and, uh, and the Islamic world. Um, these are three square bottles and um, um, originally they were thought to have been um, made in Europe and uh, just painted with, uh, with Indian uh, themes. It now looks, having, having been analysed um, by Stefan Carboni, it looks like these were actually uh, made in India by a glassmaker called Ram Singh Malam, who was who actually travelled to the ne Netherlands to Holland, where he's trained as a glassmaker. This is in the uh, late 18th century. Trained as a glassmaker, the latest techniques, and then he came back to India, and he opened a glass factory in a place called uh, Buj. So he's using European techniques, and then. And interestingly, these 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 glasses were then re these bottles were then re were exported to Europe for the first time. But again, it shows that this this relationship is is quite complex. It's quite hard to say what these really are. Um, you know, w w but it's a very complex uh, relationship. Okay, so that's just a little introduction to show you the the types of ways that. Um, that we can think about the relationship between the Islamic world and uh, and Europe. And now I'd like to move more specifically to Britain. And next picture. And we'll start with Kew Gardens. Um, this is a drawing of of, of a mosque uh, uh, built at Kew Gardens in 1761. This is one of uh, three buildings built at Kew Gardens. There was uh, also a, a Chinese pagoda, which I think still exists, and also a representation of the Alhambra Palace, and these were 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 um, were all built at uh, Kew Gardens, and um, I suppose they they represent an interest in 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 the East and the Far East with the pagoda, and show a, a physical representation of these things, not just paintings, but a physical representation. Um, this mosque, uh, from the evidence and from the plans, doesn't seem to have been an actual functioning mosque. It had no mihrab, and we have no evidence of it ever having been used as a mosque. So it's purely there to convey to people the idea of what a mosque uh, looked like. Um, I sh it's also worth remembering or remind, uh, saying that also, um, round about the same time at uh, Paynes Hill Park in Surrey, um, a Turkish tent was built, and this tent was uh, uh, built to resemble uh, imperial Turkish tents. It had is made of canvas and embroidered with it had tapestries inside and carpets. And again, it shows something of the age. This idea of um, of, of recreating um, re recreating um, the Turkish, in this case, the Turkish East. Um, And I suppose, really, it's it's sort of this is the start of this is the start of this whole idea of this this concept of Orientalism, this idea of of perhaps an interest in the Orient, an interest perhaps for decorative reasons, perhaps for um, ideas of having power over another culture, perhaps perhaps simply for educational reasons. Um, the most <coughs> famous example of um, of this, I suppose, is the Royal Pavilion at Bar Brighton. This is a again, it's a, a complex building um, built over over more than thirty years, um, and I suppose this this is a good way of expressing what's um, 
s some of the more extreme aspects of Orientalism in that the exterior of the building is, is, is built in, I suppose, an Indian Mughal style, whereas the interior is, uh, is built on a, on a Chinese theme. Again, this is this mishmash which just shows a gen general, general interest in the Orient, but not really very precise. And um, um, yeah, and so also uh, from the 18th century, if we have the next building, this is a Sezincote House in Gloucestershire. Um, this was built uh, by uh, three brothers, the Cockrell brothers, uh, one of whom had recently returned from India, and he got his brother, who is a trained architect, to design a building which would remind him of, in of India, built in the, what they called the Hindu style, Mughal, which we really mean Indian style, Mughal style. And uh, his brother had actually never been to India, but he used, um, he used books that were available at the time to create this, this uh, Mughal looking building. And then, uh, the next please. Okay. Um, and then, I suppose one of the most famous examples of, of, of Islamic type architecture of, f from Britain, it built in the Islamic style, I suppose, is, uh, is Leighton House in, um, in Holland Park in London. And this was uh, built by Lord Leighton uh, to the Arab Hall here, was built to contain his cole collection of over a thousand tiles, which he'd collected mostly from uh, Damascus in Syria. So here you have a specific relationship between building a, an oriental Islamic style building and actually archaeology, which is, which is drawn, or was kind of old, old tiles brought out, antiquities brought out from, um, from Syria. Uh, next, please. I thought I'd better put this one in. This is the... <laughs> This is the Arab room at Cardiff Castle, uh, William Burgess. Um, I suppose the, um, the interesting thing about this is that um, it's considered to be uh, one of William Burgess's best works. And um, he himself had travelled to Sicily and Constantinople. And this is where he got his ideas of Islamic architecture from. And um, he is also one of the people who believed in... Um, that, that much uh, medieval architecture was derived ultimately from, from Islamic architecture to do with the, the, the pointed arches. And he thought that really that uh, in the Middle Ages, Islamic art architecture was in, in advance of Europe and that a lot, a lot, of, lot was learnt, learnt from, um, from the Middle East. And this is his, I suppose, this is his, his physical, physical expression of that, showing this this particular type of sort of mukhanas uh, vaulting used in the in the Arab hall, in the Arab room. Um, this was this just just this was a drawing room for women, just uh, just in terms of its function. Okay, so I suppose what all these buildings have in common is none of them were had. They 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 are Islamic in style, but they had no Islamic use. They were used for other things. In a sense, they're purely decorative. They may have been used to send out certain messages, but, but really they weren't really, they certainly probably weren't used for, um, for Muslims. Now, next. Okay. Um, mosques. Well, if we, when we think about functioning mosques, I think um, there's some debate about this, but the first, the first mosque, functioning mosque, in Britain, seems to, that we know of, seems to have been built in Liv seems to be in Liverpool, and is built by Abdullah, Abdullah Quilliam, who is a Muslim convert. Um, but this, all he all he actually did is he converted two Georgian houses into a mosque, and then they were remodelled inside, and they had various forms of Islamic ornament. And this was used as a mosque and a cultural centre, but it wasn't purpose built. <coughs> and the first purpose built mosque is a mosque. Uh, called the Shah Jahan Mosque in, uh, in Woking. Um, interestingly, it was built by an Orientalist, uh, a Hungarian Orientalist, um, uh, Dr. Gottlieb William Leitner, who is uh, a linguist and Orientalist from Hungary. And um, the mosque was built by William, William Chambers, and it was um, financed by uh, by Begum Shah Jahan, who is the female ruler of Bhopal. So it's very interesting history, and not what you'd expect, I suppose, in a way, for the first 
the first purpose-built mosque that we know of in, in Britain. Okay, next picture. And just, uh, just to show you, um, I think this, this picture is quite interesting because this is just the fountain immediately outside the mosque and you some, see some people relaxing here. And I, I think it's indicative of the type of people who use the mosque. Um, this was very much a, a mosque for uh, people in the public eye. It was visited by royalty from abroad. It was frequented by politicians and uh, celebrity Muslim converts. It had this very, I suppose, high class um, feel about it and very, it was not, um, I suppose it's not typical of, of, of mosques elsewhere, a very particular um, atmosphere. Okay, next picture. And then uh, we can think a little bit about, I suppose, in a, I'd say sort of more real mosques, mosques which are built to serve a need of, of people actually, actually present. Um, now, um, I'm sure most of you will be aware that probably one of the earliest Muslim communities in, in Britain is, is here in Cardiff. And um, again, like as in Sheffield and also in Tyneside, uh, many, of the, many of the people, uh, many of the first large-scale Muslim migrants to Britain were, were Yemeni and Somali. Um, here's just a picture from Sheffield. Now, of course, these people, these people need, needed mosques. I mean... In a sense, I suppose, most of them would have just been able to pray at home or in a public space that they created. And um, I suppose quite like the Jewish, earliest Jewish, Jewish communities in Britain, they were probably quite poor and also probably faced quite a lot of prejudice. And so it's quite difficult to actually um, find the money and get the permission to actually build these mosques. So they weren't prevented from worshipping, but it's quite difficult. And so, really, it wasn't really until, next picture, the 1940s that you get the first idea of building a purpose-built mosque by Muslims for Muslims. And this is, this is one of five plans submitted to the council in Cardiff the, uh, for, um, for permission to er erect a, a mosque in Butte Town. Um, some of the earlier versions were rejected for a variety of reasons. And... The, the reason that, that the council decided to accept these and is actually um, an initiative from the government saying that since so many Muslims had actually fought for Britain during the Second World War, that some, in recompense, some sort of, um, they, sh they should be acknowledged and acknowledged, being, acknowledged by being allowed to have uh, purpose-built mosques. So there's a big struggle to get this mosque built and eventually it was the... Um, the Nur al-Islam Mosque was built in 1944 at a cost of uh, £7,000. Unfortunately, it was demolished in 1958 for, a, for, for a, a, a new mosque, so it doesn't still stand. So that's just a quick look at architecture, which, as I say, is one category of the type of thing we can think of as archaeology. Now we come to things that you might more typically associate with archaeology. Um, now, this is... This is very famous, this, uh, this dina of, um, of um, King Offa, King of Mercia. Um, I think it's, it's puzzled people and it's caused a lot of controversy over the years. Um, there seems to be some sort of consensus at the, uh, the purpose behind this now. <coughs> but I think it... What, what's good about it and very interesting about it is it shows the, um, it shows the possibilities for, for cultural, cultural uh, a mixing of cultural symbols. Um, as it says here, the, uh, the Offa Rex, which is here, is upside, is upside down, or the Arabic is upside down, one way or the other. But it's, um, well, actually, in this case, the Arabic is upside down. And... Um, I think uh, I'll talk a little bit more about coins, but the, the main thing I need to say, I suppose, is that what it seems to say is that in the um, in the eighth century, I think the the message, the big message that should come out of this is that in the eighth century, Muslim coinage within Europe was very important and uh, seen as a very powerful currency and something that people trusted. So. Um, it was regarded as something that um, <coughs> to aspire to. 
And um, probably the, the, the current theory about this coin, there's only one of them found, uh, is it came from Rome, it's found in the 19th century, and um, it was probably part of a payment made by King Offa to the, to the Pope, and um, for some reason he, he found, felt the, the reason to make a, a dinar, uh, an Arabic coin, make his coinage in the form of an Arab coin, because that would make it trusted as payment, which is interesting because he's actually paying the Pope, which is um, a very interesting idea. So we'll say a little bit more about coins now, the next picture. Now, um, coinage in, in Britain, I suppose the interesting thing about the coinage is um, there's, there's two ways that Muslim coinage got into Britain in the I suppose before the 1100s uh, and interestingly enough almost simultaneously when I started doing this research somebody called uh, Rory Naismith also has done some uh, more detailed <coughs> research on Islamic coinage in Britain before 1100 and with, with broadly similar results. Um, so this is just an example of where coins have been found within, within Britain. Um, <coughs> we, do, we don't really no, need to go into the details of all of these, except to say that I suppose there's, there's a big difference between gold coinage, which tends to come from, uh, from Spain or the Mediterranean, and silver coinage, which seems to come from uh, uh, much further east, sometimes as far as Afghanistan. Um, now the uh, the silver coinage is uh, is probably almost is found mostly in the eastern part of Britain and is uh, I think Croydon's the furthest west and it's, it seems to be associated with uh, Scandinavian coin hoards and just to say we've from Britain in total before 1100 we've got 173 Islamic coins that have been found. Whereas in Sweden, in Scandinavia, it's a very different story. In, in Sweden, for example, in two, up to 2005, that's not including recent very big finds, up to 2005, 180,000 uh, Islamic coins have been found. Uh, very, and these are all from 9th, 10th century <coughs> in Sweden. And in fact, over 20,000 coins have been found on the island of Gotland alone. So talking about big quantities. And what we get in Britain seems to be actually an overflow from that. It's, it's silver coinage which is coming over from Scandinavia. Um, and it seems to have been treated um, probably not so much as currency, but as something which was uh, used, uh, used by weight. Um, OK. Um, OK. Uh, so um, next picture. Okay, glass. Um, it's always amazing in archaeology if you have glass surviving. I mean, it is incredibly amazing. This has survived mostly because it seems to have been in the same hands for a very long time, probably since the uh, 1200s. Um, and this is a, we can see it's a, it's a, it's, it's a beaker, uh, Islamic beaker, and it's probably... Um, was probably brought, brought back uh, from Syria as, um, as, a, as a trophy or as even as a souvenir uh, from, from the Crusades. It's, it, it's, it's very rare and quite important. But within this context, I suppose what's interesting, it also belongs to a category of uh, glass vessels, which people call um, Syrio-Frankish uh, glass. And again, like, like in, the, in, the, in the glass I talked about earlier, there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a lot of debate about where this stuff was actually produced, whether it was produced in Syria, uh, because you, this, is, this is a specifically Islamic type of glass, but some of them have, have European themes on them. And um, there's, there's an idea that there are actually uh, Syrian craftsmen <coughs> working in Italy producing these, either that or... Um, Syrians producing specifically for the European market within Syria. So, um, next. Okay, ceramics. Yeah. Um, again, just to, to have a bit of local res relevance, this is from uh, Grossmont Castle in, um, in, um, in Wales. It's uh, one of two pieces which are found in the excavations. 
and um, I suppose it's it's um, uh, again it may re it probably represents something which was brought back as a souvenir from the Crusades. Um, it's got what appears to be um, an inscription around the rim, but it has been looked at in great detail and I think it is just a pretend inscription, something that's meant to look like an inscription. But it's almost um, certainly from Syria and, um, and a, a type that's quite, quite well known from, <laughs> from the 12th, 13th century. Um, next. Right. This is again um, a Syrian um, albarello or jar. Uh, excavated recently at Plantation Place in London. Um, it's Mamluk from, uh, and um, it's quite quite good that it's complete. And again, it's um, uh, this was found in an area that was probably a dock dock area in the um, in the Middle Ages, and so probably may have been brought back. Uh, it may have been what it contained that was important or it simply may have been brought as a souvenir. Uh, next picture. And here's just a picture of um, medieval uh, Syrian pottery and glass that's found in Britain, just various fine spots. So not too much. But I should say that um, this, is, this, this is only found out with, with just looking at a few reports and I'm sure, which is what I'll talk about later, that there may be other examples um, and now we're going to move on to a different type of pottery, a bit later, um, mostly, which is the uh, Spanish, Spanish pottery. Um, the interesting thing that happened with uh, the relationship between, I suppose, England and, uh, and Spain in terms of ceramics, there's quite a lot of um, ceramics came in through uh, Southampton and um, various other places on the south coast. And so there's a, a trade uh, in ceramics, Muslim cer uh, with, with mus uh, ceramics from uh, Muslim points of origin. We're not sure if this is direct contact with Muslim merchants or through, through Christian merchants in Spain, but certainly there's plentiful evidence. If we look at the next picture, here you can see this fine spots, very different from the, the picture that we get from, um, from the, uh, the Syrian pottery. So we're now we're talking about something a bit more like, like an actual trade. Um, <clears throat> and I suppose for, for anybody who's familiar with, with European or so let's, let's say English, British pottery from the, um, from the Middle Ages, it's, it's mostly not very colourful uh, and also it's, it's not really, technically it's not it's not as advanced as uh, the type of pottery you get in the Islamic world. And so this, this could have been the reason for, almost certainly was the re reason for importing a lot of this, um, this material from Spain. <clears throat> by the end of the medieval period, when we get into the 16th, 17th, by the 18th century, the Europeans were able to start making sort of high quality uh, pottery. And... Um, and they're able to, to rival that of um, the Islamic world, and they're actually exporting things to to the Middle East. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just next picture. I just put this in just because it's um, it's it's ceramic. It's um, and to show you that again, this I suppose I put it in partly also to show this this idea of representation of Islam and people's idea of what it was. This is a this is, um, this is made in pipe clay and it's a, a representation of a Turk. You also get at this time, you, uh, you get um, Turk's heads on, on, on uh, tobacco smoking pipes. Okay, so that's, um, that's ceramics. So I've just briefly just mentioned some of the types of, um, some of, the types of things that can be... Um, can, can be found. I haven't mentioned everything. There are, for example, some very interesting examples of um, Isnik plates being found. I think there's in Norwich, somebody excavated some Isnik plates and uh, seemed to be associated with some sort of meal. And, there's, um, and there are several other examples. And <coughs> I think there's a lot of potential for more work here. Um, I'll just mention that somebody called Cameron did similar work on... Uh, the relationship between Britain and Byzantine, Byzantium, 
uh, in other words, pre-Islamic period, and found went through lots and lots of reports and found a lot of correlate uh, a lot of examples. It may not be the same, but it's certainly something that's that's worth doing. Now, for the last part of this, I'm just going to talk um, a little bit about um, about something. Uh, I suppose a case study, and also I think it's 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 a way of helping to think about how you can actually think about an archaeology of of Islam in Britain. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, there's this there's this concept of Britain's <coughs> relationship with the um, with the Muslim world is is quite a big one. We've had lots and lots of contacts, and. Um, and I think to look at the, the archaeology of Islam in Britain, we also, in a way, have to look beyond, beyond Britain as well and look at how Britain impacted, certainly in the early days, how it interacted with the Muslim world. And so this brings me to the last thing, which is this uh, case study, which is based on Whitby. Okay. Here's, uh, here's a picture of Whitby. A few things to note in here. Here you've got Whitby Abbey. It's a very ancient abbey, very famous. And also here, you can see uh, this pier or mole. It's called a mole. It's, uh, it's something Whitby incidentally faces into the North Sea, directly into the North Sea. It's a very, very difficult harbour. And it's a place that was used until, I suppose, it's famous for whaling. But it's quite a and very difficult harbour to get into, very dangerous place. But also, it's, a very, it's an important port. So. This mole was built here, and it was built by somebody called Hugh Chomley. Okay, I'll just, just mention his name now. Um, and then, uh, next picture. Right. Now, this is the, uh, the front of Abbey House, which... Can we just move back, back one to the previous one? Yeah, okay. And Abbey House is over here. Uh, when the uh, monasteries were dissolved in the 16th century, uh, the abbot's house was given to an ancestor of, of Hugh Chomley. Uh, it's currently the, the youth hostel in Whitby, and it's been remodelled several times. And part of it is used by English Heritage as the, as the museum for the abbey site. Um, and here we have the, the front of the house as remodelled by Hugh Chomley II in 1672. Now, so far, I suppose, the, I suppose the question is, what has any of this got to do with uh, the Islamic world? Um, well, Hugh Chomley was very concerned with uh, the shipping getting in and out of Whitby, and uh, so he, he rebuilt the, uh, the pier, the mole, that stone, stone pier that goes out into the sea at Whitby, and because he studied engineering and he made a big study of, of various Roman techniques, all the techniques available at the time, and he built this pier out into the sea, which is considered very successful. And on the basis of this, he was given a special commission to build a pier in Tangier. Now, <coughs> why Tangier? Well, Tangier was, one of, in a way, one of Britain's first sort of... Uh, concrete encounters with the concrete by the fact that with the Muslim world where we actually had a, a, a colony established within, uh, within the, the Muslim world. And um, this dates from a period between 1661 and 1684 when Tangier was given as a, a wedding present by the Portuguese um, uh, Catherine of Braganza is given as a wedding present to, to the English king. And they weren't too sure what to do with it, and they decided that maybe they'll try and establish it as a free port to try and make some money out of it. And also, it should be said that it's in a very strategic position. It's uh, Straits of Gibraltar, and so it's potentially it was a, it was a very good place to to make money from it, to, as used as a port. But it's got a problem that the port is actually not very good. It's 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 a, it's into the open sea. And it's deep sea. And it's actually very often very difficult to land ships there. So Hugh Chomley II was asked to come to Tangier to uh, build this mole, to build a, a, a pier there. And um, he went there between 1663 and 1676. So it's a period of about more than 10 years, 13 years. He's, over all this time, he was building this pier. It was very difficult. They had lots of problems because it's very deep water. 
and a lot of people said this is too expensive and they had to bring they had to bring slaves over from America to build it and all, all different things. And in the end, they brought masons from Whitby to, um, to Tangier to, uh, to build the mole. In the end, the, um, the governor got fed up with this and he said, this is too expensive and he is dismissed. But I think Hugh Chomley had made quite a lot of money from this, with which he's able to remodel the, the front of the house. So one of these things which I mentioned is I think it would be interesting certainly to look at that first early English presence in Tangier and there is, um, there is this new Whitby which was, which was constructed. But also I suppose more tangibly is, um, next picture, we have um, this which represents a beam which was found inserted within the uh, Abbey House. This is at the back of that facade. Um, and this was discovered in uh, 2006, next picture, when the, when the building was being remodelled. And you can see this is part of the beam in there. Um, next picture. Now this beam is, yeah, you can see it's nearly six metres long and it's, it's wooden and it's carved with sort of like a rope moulding here. And it's got in the centre a picture of a person. I can't see it very well from here and two, I think, dogs. It's not a very good picture. Um, next picture, you might see it a bit better. Here's the two dogs and there's... So it's obviously some sort of hunting scene. Um, initially, it was thought to date from the 13th century and people thought it may be something to do with the Abbey or something. Uh, but recently, there's been... This is the, 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 the structural analysis of where this came from has been uh, questioned. And... On stylistic grounds, I think it looks more like 17th century, sometime from the, in fact, from Sir Hugh Chomley's time. And then, if you look at the next picture, I think, for me, this is quite convincing as well. You have palm trees depicted on this, on this piece of wood. So what you've got, then, is a very, this, this huge beam which uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't been dated yet, it can, be it can be dated, and it also hasn't been identified the type of wood. But it's I think it's most likely to have been maybe from Britain, we need to check that, but I think it seems to be some sort of memento, some sort of memory of uh, Sir Hugh Chomley's time in Tangier. And we know from the various accounts that he very much liked being there. He liked, he liked going hunting, this is one of the things that occurs. And so this, this is something that was made specifically to recount his, uh, his, his time in Tangier. Okay, so... Um, okay. Uh, we've got the last, last picture now. Yeah. Um, and just to show you, sort of, I suppose, how much all of this is embedded within British culture, I just showed you this picture of this gun, which again... This also says something a bit about the complex relationship between, between Britain and other places and also the complex history of objects and I suppose it's saying a little bit about the, um, how the, we, can't, we can't assume that, that these relationships are simple. This is, a, this is a, a, a gun, a Turkish gun, it's in Horse Guards Parade in London and um, it dates from the 16th century, uh, from the time of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, and it was actually captured in Egypt at the ba Battle of Abukir Bay, and it was brought back to, to England and remounted as a, as, a, as a trophy of war. So it's got a complex history. It's, it's both Turkish, both Egyptian, both British. And I think it says really that through, th through looking at material culture, you can see a, a, a different picture and a dif different story than you get through, uh, through documents. Thank you.